Um, so, uh, and last and possibly least, this is actually not such an interesting talk in terms of results. It makes me to talk about how uh, my student Antoine Poirier and I uh, tried and failed to make a huge amount of progress on this. Um, although, um, kind of talking about what is the NRV question? I don't think he called it that. I just abbreviate it that way. Um, does there exist a matroid with n elements, rank R, and B bases? For any N, R, and B. Um, I think he openly asked this question maybe 40 years ago. Um, it did actually appear as a conjecture in a re more recent paper of Dylan and Gordon. Um, there's some obvious conditions. Well, there better be at least one basis, otherwise you've got the rank wrong. And there can be at most N Jews R bases, otherwise something is not happening right either. Uh, and also you may as well assume that and is at least as big as R, otherwise you're not really talking about a matroid. Right? Um, so there's sort of obvious, sort of feasible land here. Um, and then you can sort of simplify your life a little bit and say, well, we know about duality, and when you take the dual, the number of bases stay the same, but it's just complementary. So by duality, it should suffice to just prove this for all n greater than equal to 2R. So this is your first sort of shortcut there. Um, uh, I should say, uh, and so what? So the only known counterexample, counterexample, which was found by Anna Denier, is uh, n equals six, r equals three, and b equals eleven. There is no six-element rank three element uh, rank three matroid with exactly eleven bases, and um, I don't think anybody has a better explanation of that than just the fact that it doesn't work. Um, and that's the only one that's been found, and uh, the census that Gordon and Dylan did up to nine element matroids confirmed that's the only one up to n equals nine. Am I right there, I think? Yeah. Uh, is it, is, did that up to n equals 10? No, it doesn't. Yeah, that one was um, So, duality, what can we do here? There's a couple of, maybe I'll sort of put our theorem up here. Um, it is a theorem, but the way I'm going to state it's going to look a little bit weird. And Pointless, but when you turn out of uh, the particular bounds here. Uh, well, let me just sort of abbreviate it like this. For r equals 2, everything's okay. All works for rank 2 matroids, not a big surprise. For rank 3, everything's okay. For rank at least 6, um, I don't know what we've got here to say about 4 and 5. And for n, at least uh, r times 2e to the r and b between n choose r and r to e to the r at the height. <laughs> Plus one in there. Everything's okay. And that looks like a bizarre statement. Um, it, it'll make, well, it'll look a little bit less ridiculous when I show you sort of how we prove that. What does r equals three tech mean then? What um, you... For r equals three and any Except for, except, except, for except for this one, yes. Except for that one. Um, and I should say that Fan and Wong on a paper that's on the archive uh, did similar results. Um, they certainly did two and three. Um, I believe, well, they did do for all R greater than equal to four. Something more or less similar to this. Their paper they cast entirely in terms of co rank. So it's a little bit interesting to read their proof for co-rank too. It's a little bit hard to get a feel for. Um, and they don't state anything like this at all, but they get essentially the same thing for exponentially, exponential bound in n and for it to here. Um, and, I, and I'll say that although this looks a little bit weird, one thing this says as a corollary of this is if you fix the rank, here in six, there is a enormous gargantuan n, bigger than this, such that everything works beyond that point. Right? So it follows that the, for any fixed rank, there's only a finite number of things to check. Uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, H of the universe kind of finite. Um, so they do similar results. Um, when we first did this, we weren't aware of their paper. Um, their methods are kind of totally different, so I find that. But, um, so maybe I'll show you a little bit of a little bit of how that works. Um, the rank two cases may be a tiny bit interesting in the sense that the general picture, so this is the plane of R equals two, and this is the B axis, and this is the N axis, but the scale on these things is gonna be completely bizarre, right? So N steps across here, something like this, maybe. And B 
be you'd need a microscope to see the graduations. Okay, so this is, think of this curve as n choose r, which is n choose 2 in this case. Okay, choose 2, but n choose r in general. Um, and <clears throat> there's a couple of little inductions you can use here. Certainly if I have a matrix and they add a loop or a code loop, I don't change the number of bases. n goes up by 1, and if I'm adding a code loop, r goes up by 1 as well. And if you think of what that does, that says that if I've got a point here where I can find a matrix with those parameters, then I can add um, loops and move to the right. So, in fact, all we have to do is show these little vertical intervals here. And what those vertical intervals are, if say this is the value n, and this is k minus 1, that's n choose 2, um, this is n minus 1 choose 2, or n choose r, n minus 1 choose r. If I can show this little interval here has a matroid for every point on there, if you remember the scale, this is huge, then 1 to the left will fill this in below, 1 to the left will fill that in that way. So I can do this by uh, So all we have to do actually is construct matroids with this many bases for each value of n. And it turns out there's a really easy way to do that. Well, you just start off with a line, so a bunch of points, and that gives this guy. And then you just have to figure out a way of removing one basis at a time. And it turns out that the numerology works that if you have, say, two parallel classes of the same size, I'll say two and three. You can imagine they're all aligned with one another, right? Two. And you transition to the following <clears throat> k minus one and k plus one. You've filled one basis. And it turns out that if you start with this and you play a little staircase game and you move things along one at a time until you get to a staircase where you can't do that anymore, that's exactly as much as you need to get that. Just as, there's a few little details to check if, for instance, n is not a triangular number, but if it isn't, it works out better. It's a little argument like that that just says you get exactly for every n, you get all of those uh, matroids for every point on that interval. So that's kind of nice, and that's basically a, a modulo actually checking that the inequalities I propose are true there, that they actually are true. Um, this picture is kind of nice because it shows us that we really just need to construct a small number of matroids for each possible n here. We don't actually have to construct them all. And for rank 3, you do something largely similar. You start off with something that Antoine wanted to call the spike, but for obvious reasons I wouldn't let him. Although you can see why he might have thought a spike would be a good name for something that looked like this, <laughs> except that picture is in rank 3. So a bunch of lines intersecting at a point. Um, I think I think he called it a star in the end or something he wanted to. This is a rank three. That's not a, not a spike. Um, and if you look at this, what are the non bases? It's actually easier to count the sets of size r that are not bases. Well, they're the sets of three elements on one line here. So you can count those fairly easily if you know what how many points are on this line and how many points are on that line and how many points are on the, the kth line, if you like. Actually, you not call it the kth line. I'll call it the s line. Um, and that does not give you all the ones of rank 3. But then what you do is you stick beside it another line, which is not intersecting that, which is one of the ones you constructed up here. Right? So you take a, point, uh, a line that has something like this, but it may have some parallel points in it, etc. And without going through all the details, let's just look at where the non bases are. Triples on a line over here. Any three points at all in here. So that's a lot. So if there's k points here, and n minus k, then we get something like k choose 3. The non-bases are k choose 3 plus the sum of all the ni's, which is 3, 3 points on there, plus however many non-former bases you had over here, that means parallel pairs, times n minus k. So let me just call that, you know, number of parallel pairs times n minus k. 
Um, and there's a bit of numerology to do to show that you can accomplish an analogous thing to this. You can get the right interval covered each time. Um, there the numerology is a little bit more obscure. And actually, I'm semi-lying here. You have to do some small cases by hand. Right? I think for n up to 22, you have to be a little bit more creative to do your put, put a second star beside it or something like that. Um, so by hand is not so bad. You can almost almost pencil it pretty quickly. Um, and then that construction works for many equals 22. So that's two or three. So what do we want to do for the six? So, so there must be a reason there why it doesn't work for Anna's counterexample. Does yeah, well, this is what I said, that the, the computational thing is down to yeah, right, right. n equals 22. Sure. And of course, you can't find one for yeah. that one particular case, but you can find one for the others. And that sounds bad when you think of like all right three matroids with 22 elements, but you're not doing that at all. Mm. You're just finding one for every feasible parameter pair. And you can do them semi-systematically. And, and that's that region there where you do them by hand is where that counterexample pops up. Or is confirmed yet again. <laughs> um, so what happens for some fixed rank here? So this is now R. I guess I want to say greater than 6, although I haven't explained to you where the 6 comes from yet. But we want to do the same kind of thing here. So you could imagine uh, maybe this is. 2R, because everything below that, I'm going to get my duality. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to, for each value, I'd like to cover an interval. Kind of like this, all the way down, etc. And then I would be able to use this induction across like that. Um, and it turns out that if you look at this one here, um, that interval here, maybe I should have to draw it Different. So remember here, this actually just works for all. You don't need to use a duality. Um, this interval here, you would get by adding a coloop from previous rank. Mm. You would get it coloop from r minus one. Um, as it would, that assumes that you've already done r minus one, which we may not have in this case. Um, recall that I didn't. I said we couldn't actually say anything about four or five. And one would hope that this little series here would march all the way down to n equals 2r. And if you could do that, you'd be done. Um, I stopped there because you can't actually do that. Um, the construction we came up with, it's kind of actually simple and naive. And what's interesting is that as you complexify it in the obvious ways, you get nothing new. So the matroids look like the following. Take some k element rank r minus 1. Right? Um, with a bunch of points. I haven't told you, I don't need to place them in your 3D. I'll explain to you exactly how they come out here. And then there's n minus k points outside of that. So if you like this is a hyperplane. <coughs> and I want to choose a bunch of special sets in here. And I'm going to call them, uh, for lack of a better word, the Knuth collection of sets. It's basically the construction in Knuth's old paper, although this is the version that Rudy mentioned to me last time. Um, so if you take a matroid like this, so aside, take points, uh, I'm just going to label them 1, 2, up to n, and I'm going to consider a bunch of r subsets of these, and I'm going to say sj is the set of all r subsets whose sum is congruent to j mod n, so I'm thinking the points is integers. So I'll take a collection of R of these things here, such as their labels, add up to something with J mod N. Um, and if you think about it, two such subsets cannot have symmetric difference two. Because then the other thing that's not in one to the other would have to have the same value. So these form the circuit hyperplanes of a sparse painting matroid. In particular, they give you a matroid. And for one of these values of J, uh, you get at least N choose R over N. For at least one of them. In fact, it's not too hard to compute the sizes of all of them. Um, you could do that, but it would be a little better. Um, and this will give you a collection of circuits of a matroid. You can do that. So I'm going to call this a Knuth collection. So what do I do over here? Well, I take this Knuth collection of r minus 1 subsets. 
And I also take a Q's collection of R minus 3 subsets. I don't know what to do with them yet. And over here, I'm going to take a Q's collection of 3 sets. Right, so I've got three kind of collections here. These ones are in this side, this one's in this side. Um, and I'm just going to declare, well, first of all, this whole thing is supposed to have rank R minus 1. Any R set in here is automatically going to be a non-basis. Oh, good to distract from that. Um, I'm going to declare these guys, a size R minus 1, to be circuits in here. And then for each one of these, or, or sorry, I'm going to, for these ones, I can declare each of them to either be or not be a circuit, as per my choice. For each one of these and each one of these, if you think about them, I can individually, for every pair in the, in the, in the Cartesian product, I can say yes or no for circuit. And you have to go through a little bit of argument there to show that you actually get a matroid in there. So in other words, I can take this R minus 3 with this 3 set as a circuit, but with this 3 set it isn't, but this 3 set with that one is or isn't, as many as you like. Right? So you can go one at a time between this times this and zero. So what do you get here? So let's look at the number of non-bases in such a thing. Well, it's k choose r, which is sort of like what we had at the beginning with the, with the, the line and the star beside it. Any r set in there is just not going to be a basis, full stop. Plus, um, well, however many of these guys you chose to be circuits in here, when you add one of these points, they will not be a basis. So let's call that S times N minus K. Right? And what can S be? S can be from 0 up to the maximum of this thing. Um, you might think, oh, wouldn't they also form a non-base at this another point in here? Yes, they would, but that already got counted. And then you can have however many of these cross ones you want. So I'll just put the parameters here. The S can be anything up to 0. K choose uh, R minus 1 over K. And D can be anything from 0 to, uh, what is it, K choose R minus 3 over K times N minus K times 3 over N minus K. That's a K. That's a good looking, I think. And for any such parameter choice, you will get a matroid with exactly that number of non-bases. And the idea is, well, this one you can step along by one at a time. So you just keep ratcheting up by one. Think of this as the low order digit. And this one, you can ratchet S up by one, but it's got this factor here. So the idea is, can you ratchet this up enough so that you can increment this and drop this down to zero and still be a continuous interval? And well, you can, depending on the parameters. And eventually, this thing hits its maximum, and you increase K by one. Now, what you have to make sure that all that it is feasible for any value there, but you have to make sure that that's a continuous interval of integers. Integers? <laughs> 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 you know what I mean. Um, and to do that, it's maybe not obvious, what you actually need is k to be at most n over 2. Right? That's not immediately obvious, but what happens if k gets too large, this step from k to k plus 1 is so huge that you, you just don't have enough down here to catch it. Right? So it's not that this fails, it's just you don't get an interval there. So, so, so why do you have just three digits? Well, you, you, you can you can make you're, yep. I mean, you're creating a Cajun matrix, right? Yep. So you uh, just you're, make your your checks in the middle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're accumulating a, a large number of checks here. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, yeah, there are there are some things you can do here that'll help you do better. If I don't answer your question in a couple minutes, you can ask it anyway. Um, but the problem is really this thing. And what does this tell me? This tells me that I can't march this little sequence down here to n equals 2r, and basically that tells me that I'm stuck at about n around r to e to the r. Right, so this little sequence here marches down to there. And so you get all that. So what do you get? Well, if you sort of think of what this is, you've covered all that region. And you might think, oh, why don't I just use the thing I had for the previous rank, having a co-loop. If you do that from the r minus 1 plane, so this is my three-dimensional graph now, that thing will plop down in here somewhere. It will not touch that line for you too long. It will only touch that line if you manage to make it down to n equals 2r. That's when you can usefully use that. So this is sort of empty. 
Um, on the other hand, I did say there's a finite number for the R. Well, why is that? So this is the audience participation uh, part. Uh, rank 75 Metroid with 433 billion bases. Examples? <laughs> Any number of elements? Uh, um, sounds like it wouldn't have to rank, rank 75 with, you know, 437 bases. This is what you just take a basis right. and then parallel extensions. Yeah, on one yeah. you just take a, take a basis and use the place one point by this gigantic parallel. So somewhere out here, you know, there are little check marks. And since this height is finite, you can draw a line out here, right, capital N. And you can probably do something more intelligent than what, I, what we just said there. But that does mean that there's this quite finite region for each rank. <laughs> finite in quotation marks. <laughs> um, um, and that's basically as good as we can do here. Why do I need the six? Because if I'm going to choose three sets out here, I need to have at least three things out here, and it just doesn't work otherwise. Maybe to come back, I'll see if I'll answer your question now. So there's a few things you might think here. One thing you might think is, well, don't just put one of these things, put a few of them around here. Instead of having one sort of block of rank R minus one, that doesn't give you anything. If you're going to get this down low enough, you eventually need K to be large. That doesn't help. The other kind of thing that I've got, this might be what you were talking about, is why stop at three? Why not do r minus five and five, and r minus seven and seven? And that gives you a matroid. And then you get a lot of them. This bound gets worse, but maybe for large enough r it works. Um, surprisingly enough, it doesn't give you anything more. I think, I think it slightly changes this bound, but it's still exponential. Um, you can't actually, it doesn't actually give you more. At the end of the day, this kind of construction, what's really giving it to you is all of your R sets in here and the, the first cross set, if you will. So that doesn't give you anything either. I don't think I want to do exactly that. Well, I, okay. to, I want to pack balls in the Johnson graph. So yeah. sets of this of radius zero, those are the certain hyper planes, yeah. sets of radius one. I mean, you, 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 can, you can, and it's just creating a paper matrix. Yeah. You only need a few of each size ball, right? If you just write down the n area expansion of the number of non daisies, yeah. you to you first check out the biggest ball you can you can fit in there, yeah. you take it out, and then you still have all of the rest of the of the of the Johnson graph to fit in more balls, each time nibbling away uh, Well, I mean we we tried things like that. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're meaning or not. Um, there's a lot of other variations on this. You can put a little circuit beside this and play other little games. Um, but this but will it seemed to come down to logarithmically many balls, right? Well, I, I'd be interested to talk to you about that. Yeah. Anyway, so that was that was our best construction. We had another type of construction which we don't have any proof for, but which numerically seems to work a bit better. I don't know, am I out of time? Or? Yeah. I'd be interested in hearing more about that. And the other sort of idea, well, the problem is it's much harder to actually count the exact structures in here. If I just, oops, that, if I just take a simplex on R, and I'm going to call them vertices now, not elements, and if I were to place elements on the vertices and edges of this, I would get a frame of matroid, right? right? So I'm going to allow myself to sort of place some elements here. Maybe I'll put some on this line, maybe on this line, maybe on this one. Maybe I'll put a whole parallel class on that vertex. But now I'm going to allow myself to keep going. I'm going to allow myself to place some elements freely, say, on this plane, maybe some on that plane, maybe a bunch over here, and maybe a bunch in the interior of this. So at any dimension of simplex, um, the idea being this allows you a lot more small circuit hyperplane. Uh, sorry, small circuits. Um, this construction only gives you very large circuits, which is why it seems harder to get this. Um, so I guess that's sort of like having a generalized frame matrix. I'm not sure if that has a meaning. Transversal matrix. Is it? Is it a transversal? Yeah, if you're putting the points freely, it's okay. exactly transversal. I, I thought, yeah. Right. Um, anyway, we did some computations with that, and it seemed for some small ones that you could actually get them, but it was a little bit harder to write down the exact formulas. Because yeah, that was the question I was going to ask: is, is do you know what happens when you move to other natural subclasses? And well, in I, my I mind, the natural subclass I had in mind was transversal matrix. Okay. Well, I was I was thinking of it this way. I wasn't sure if that was. Yeah. Uh, 
So you, you think the whole conjecture might be true for matroids like that? I mean, what about rank two? Because you're on your lab. If you rank two oh, and transverse, you're on your lab, two parallel classes. That's, uh, you get this dot. Maybe here. not. Um, so I, I, I thought at that stage. Maybe for large enough rank. Um, for large enough rank, it might be okay. Yeah. But it was a harder to write down expressions for bases in terms of just yeah. like maybe moving to the transversal. Yeah. Point was better, yeah. But anyway, that's, that's about all we have there. So. Thank you. How can you possibly say where the E was coming from? It's it's a bound of a bound, and you take some exponential thing. I mean, it's that's why I said it's not really important what that expression is. It's exponential or not. Sure. And it's not. I mean, if you were to dig up what our proof actually says, it says something better than that. But you know, choose R in there somewhere. So it's bound on the binomial coefficient. Yeah. Or product. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to write a really complicated statement of exactly what it is, but sure. Yeah. All right, thanks again.